As chronic diseases continue to impact our lives with increasing frequency, there's a growing curiosity about the role of sleep in managing and preventing these conditions. Notably, insufficient sleep has been identified as a contributing factor to several chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity and depression. For example, when it comes to diabetes, research has established a connection between inadequate sleep and an elevated risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Similarly, in cardiovascular health, individuals with sleep disorders like sleep apnea are at a heightened risk of conditions such as hypertension, stroke and heart disease. Moving on to obesity, studies have highlighted the correlation between short sleep duration and weight gain. And when it comes to children, it is particularly concerning as insufficient sleep may interfere with crucial brain development processes. Lastly, the delicate relationship between sleep and depression adds another layer of complexity. While sleep disturbances are often symptoms of depression, recent findings suggest that addressing sleep disorders like sleep apnea and adequate sleep can help reduce or alleviate depressive symptoms. Today, we're privileged to have Luke Cotino, renowned celebrity lifestyle and health expert, joining us to delve into the vital importance of sleep. Let's explore together how prioritizing sleep can be a cornerstone for our overall health and well-being. Duke, hi, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here, thank you. Well, good to have you back again. I've been seeing a lot of your posts and uh, a lot of it has this T-shirt that you're wearing, I am Mr. Sleep. Tell us more about this particular T-shirt. What are you trying to advocate? What is the importance of sleep? Great, Ekta. So a couple of months ago, I decided, let me look at my data. We have so many sick people, mm -hmm. cancer, cardiovascular, diabetes. I love how you've pulled out the correlation of the science and sleep deprivation. And I asked myself, do people need more diets? Do they need more medicine? We have enough of all of that stuff. What are we missing? And then I started looking at the data because all of our clients fill up forms before they come to us. Mm -hmm. And sleep deprivation is a commonality between most of these people and children who have lifestyle diseases. Now, I'm not saying this has caused it alone, but it's a contributing factor. So while, yes, we have great medical systems that can medicate you the right way, we have nutrition to fit in. What about our sleep? That's free, it's inexpensive, and it's one of the most misused, mm -hmm. misused tools that we have for prevention as well as recovery. So I decided, hey, I want to be Mr. Sleep and start driving awareness because everyone knows what they should eat. Everyone knows, please go to a doctor, listen to your doctor, take your meds. All of, all of that is good. Mm. But I think sleep makes the biggest difference and we're trying to make people understand. I reached out to people and I said, do you know why you sleep? Is it important for your health? They said, a lot of people said, no, I'll sleep when I die. It's a waste of time. I should make money. I want to spend more time with my family when I come home from work. And I was like, okay, we can do this and sleep well, mm. because that's the foundation. That's the foundation stone of great health. But where do you think Indians are going wrong in their entire routine when it comes to sleep? So I think, you know, when something is not important to us, like I always say, what we don't value, we don't prioritize. Mm -hmm. You know, we value things like work, coming home, being with family, television, OTT platforms, social media, which is all good. But the point is, how do I continue to do all of this? But hey, it's sleep time, let me go to sleep. A simple example, our parents, when they have children, you know, moms and dads want to create that sleep hygiene for a child because they know all the growth is going to happen while the child sleeps. So we do it for a few years. And then after that, we stop doing it, but we're the same human being, just a different age and a different size, but the same body and brain that requires sleep. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about how less sleep is associated with chronic diseases. It's associated with inflammation in the body. There, are, there is research indicating that it's uh, associated with heart disease, kidney disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke and depression, which I'll come to in just a bit more specifically. But how does it contribute to these chronic diseases and inflammation? So let's understand the commonality between all the diseases you mentioned is chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation happens when our immune systems are not relaxed, they're confused, they're working the wrong way, they're always erratic because we're on the go, we're stressed out all the time, we don't relax and we don't sleep. Now, the reason why human beings sleep is for several functions. One of it, your immune system starts to get smarter, it does certain jobs that it doesn't do when we're awake. 
inflammation starts to come down, which is why when you, when you undergo a surgery, your doctor will immediately tell you, go home and rest. Mm. Because he or she knows that only when you rest can the body repair itself. So when we're in a process of deep sleep, three things happen. Uh, we're in a parasympathetic nervous system, which means we can rest, we can digest, and we can repair and regenerate. But right now, while you and I are awake, okay, we're in the sympathetic nervous system because we're on television, we're prepped to answer questions. Mm. I'm not re able to regenerate. I'm not in the right system. So when I sleep, regeneration starts. Mm. That's why if you look at a child or anyone, you fall down and you get a wound. Mm. The scab doesn't grow during the day. You sleep, you wake up, and then you find a scab has grown. So a lot of healing and regeneration, inflammatory processes and mechanisms start to work efficiently when we sleep and when we're sleep deprived. These are lifestyle diseases that you mentioned. Mm. You know, they start to go. And if you, if you look at the data of a diabetic and when you take their blood sugar levels in the morning and you see they're all over the place, the first two questions, how much did you sleep? What time did you eat your last meal? Mm. And they have a direct impact on your blood sugar levels in the morning. And in our country right now, pre-diabetes is huge. Mm. And sleep deprivation is directly connected with that and all the other conditions that you mentioned. Okay, well, I'm going to come to the connection of sleep with mental health dis disorders such as depression. Now, studies have shown that not only insufficient sleep, but um, uh, it is uh, too much sleep, which also increases the risk of mental health disorders such as depression. Uh, give us a sense in terms of what the connections are and what do you see in your practice? Absolutely. So see, we fo follow circadian rhythms, which mm -hmm. is usually sunset, sunrise. Everything is the law of nature. Everything is a rhythm. You put your hand on your chest, you have a rhythm of your heartbeat, a pulse, your breath, rhythm, digestive cycle, rhythm. Sleep is a rhythm that is also controlled and our rhythms change. They start and they end. So I do have to wake up within a particular time. Now, when is this? When my body sends a signal, everything is done, regeneration is done, detoxification is done, we automatically wake up, automatically. For some people, this could be seven hours, some people eight. Now, if I'm sleep deprived or I'm depressed mm -hmm. or I don't have a purpose to wake up to that day, I'm just feeling, you know, absolutely like low and I try to sleep nine hours or 10 hours, this can have the reverse effect, not just on my mood, but even my cardiovascular health sleeping for more than required can actually disturb your actual natural circadian rhythm, now producing inflammation. Mm -hmm. I need to wake up at a particular time because there are several functions in the body. That's why cortisol shoots up when we wake. Mm -hmm. But if I'm still sleeping, my blood sugar levels have to balance. So anything in excess or too little is a harm in the body, and that's the connection. When we wake up, we connect with natural light. So my dopamine, my serotonin, all of my neurotransmitters that are linked with my mood start to balance. But if I'm sleeping and sleeping in that dark room and I'm not adjusted to the circadian rhythm, that imbalance of my neurotransmitters happen, which immediately affect my mood. Okay, so sleeping too little and sleeping too much, both of them can probably have impact on mental health disorders. But uh, just to extend that point uh, forward, you know, I was reading a couple of, uh, I was looking at a couple of your posts and you've indicated that a lot of people who come to you with lack of purpose, direction, possibly some form of depression, the first thing you work on is sleep. So what have been the visible changes in your practice? So actually, it's, uh, you are right about that. My first question to anyone who comes to me, whether they have a pimple on their face to a fourth stage cancer, is their sleep? Because see, all these people coming to us already have their doctors treating them. We're, we're integrative medicine. Hmm. They already have some changes happening. For me, recovery is all about the environment. We can have the best medication, but the wrong environment. Mm. So how do you create that environment? It's sleep. For depression, for cardiovascular, for cancer, when the body's able to sleep deeply, hormones start to get balanced. Hormones are your communicators. Mm. Hormones are chemical messengers that's telling the body what to do, what not to do. So when we have hormonal imbalances, either someone's producing too much estrogen or too little testosterone because the communication is wrong. So the first question is sleep, because if you're sleep deprived and you already have symptoms of depression, your depression's actually gonna get worse. Mm. And we don't want that person to have to take more medicine to fix a problem that sleep can fix. Mm. So once we assess their sleep, then we know, okay, these are the avenues we're gonna have to work with. It doesn't have to be always more medicine or more superfoods or more exercise. Mm. Sometimes we need to slow down and say, just sleep well. And when our patients start to sleep better, it's 
the reflection is not just on their bodies, it's at a symptomatic level and even in their blood parameters mm. directly. So that's why sleep continues to be a very, very important question for us. What is the linkage of sleep with stress? Everything. And a little bit of science over here, because once people understand this, now you and I, if we get stressed out, cortisol increases, adrenaline increases. When that increases, estrogen goes up, progesterone comes down, testosterone comes down. We have a hormonal imbalance. We're fine for a short period of time. Mm. But if I continue moving on from one stressor to another, cortisol stays up. Mm. Now my blood pressure, my blood sugar, my cholesterol, and all the hormones are mm. out of whack. Mm. And that, that leads to chronic illness eventually. Mm. So we can be stressed. All of us are with stress. But how quickly we can diffuse it or realize I'm stressed. Let me take a five-minute break. Breathe, settle down, bring down the cortisol. Mm. So the more stressed you are, the more inflammation you're going to have, the more weight you're going to carry, stubborn weight. There are a few people who, are, who react the opposite way. When they're stressed, they don't eat, so they lose weight. But for most people, because of that excess estrogen and insulin, when your insulin is high, you can never burn body fat. Mm. So you'd be doing a one-hour workout, but you're not burning fat. Mm. You're still breaking down sugar, glycogen in the body, and that's why people get frustrated with their workouts. Now, you bring in sleep as your deepest rest. When you improve sleep, fat loss becomes easier. Mm. Fat loss becomes easier. Most of the metabolic syndromes that we spoke about are linked with obesity and excess fat cells. Mm. So chronic stress and uh, obesity and all of these problems are directly connected. Now, let's not get confused. You and I get stressed a little bit. Please, that stress is good for us, mm. but it can't stay chronically high all the time. It needs to come down. We need to relax. Have an outburst, relax. Take a walk outside, calm down, bring down cortisol. The quicker we bring down cortisol, the healthier we are. Yeah, but you know, there are some problems in families where there is chronic stress yes. and that probably weighs on the entire family and that causes disturbances of sleep maybe on a longer term basis. Say somebody has cancer in the family, for example, or is dealing with a disease, etc. In that case, uh, you know, sleep is beyond your control. You want to sleep, but you just have too much stress, which allows you to sleep. What does one do in one case? In that There's case? a beautiful word that I'll introduce right now. It's called acceptance. It's the only way. See, we can't ask families like this, sit down and meditate. They're so stressed out. It can help them a little bit. But the, the truth is, okay, there's, let's say, hypothetical family, there's a cancer diagnosis, someone's suffering. All we can do right now, accept the situation and do our best. But most of us, because of this emotional stress, we're trying to control things that are not in our control. Mm. We don't know what outcomes are going to be. So a lot of our stress is broken down by, I accept the situation. What is the best I can do? Most people don't move to action. We're still stuck in problem solving. Why did it happen? Victim mode, all of that. And it's okay to go through those phases. But finally, even for the patient to get better, they have to be in a state of acceptance. And now the family, okay, this is there. We're all doing our best. These are responsibilities. We also start to realize we need to look after our health for the patient. Mm. So we don't stop eating well. We don't stop sleeping well. These are tools that enable us to better help people who need our help in these families. And then there are some toxic relationships. But again, we need to fix those things. We can't, we can't upset the foundations of human health for a temporary problem. But take help at that point. Speak to a counselor where you can vent out, talk, because the more you communicate and vent, the lesser your stress is going to be. What is the concept of sleep deficit or sleep debt? Does that actually exist? No, absolutely not. I'll give you an example. In seven or eight hours of sleep, there's magic that happens. We can't take a split. Because in our REMs and non-REMs, there are certain stages of sleep. Mm. In non-REM 1, there are certain functions that happen. Non-REM 2. Non-REM 3, which is towards the latter part, is the most important. That's when detoxification happens, and that's when our hormonal balance happens. So let's say I, I have disturbed sleep. I've not reached my full cycle. Mm. And let's say I take an afternoon nap. My body's not going to go back and say, let's start off at non-REM 3. Mm. I, I would love to take an afternoon nap to kind of build that rest and recovery, but sleep that doesn't work for us. A lot of people think I'll sleep on the weekend for 10, 11, 12, 13, because the body's dynamic. Right now it's working for us every second of the day and night. Mm. So it needs its rhythm when it needs its rhythm. So how important is sleeping on time? It's beautiful because it's a rhythm. Mm. It's a rhythm. So if you look at nocturnal animals, right? they will come out at night. You will never find a day animal awake at night and a nocturnal awake at day. Humans are the only species because of lifestyle where you know, we kind of turn this model on its head. But we know today that science is showing us, and this is not to put pressure on anyone, the two hours before midnight are the most powerful for the human body when it comes to sleep. 
But now, we don't have to get worried about that. There are pilots, there's the army, there's the navy, there are doctors, nurses working shifts. It's not a problem. As long as the body finally gets the sleep that it requires, mm -hmm. we can function, we can prevent, and we can recover. But now let's say I have the ability to sleep at 10, but I'm sleeping at three or four in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then I have to wake up at eight for work. Mm -hmm. I'm sleep deprived and I am creating huge problems in the human body. Okay, how important is sleep when it comes to exercise? Say for athletes, marathoners, you've heard of, you know, high level executives sleeping for four hours and then going for a jog and then sometimes even, you know, it not working out well and collapsing. It's absolutely ridiculous it's because when we exercise more, we need more recovery. Right? What do athletes do? Eat, sleep, and train. Repeat. They can train that much because they rest that much. So I always tell people, they like, oh, I landed from New York and I went for a run. Great for Instagram and Facebook, but not great for you. Mm. The point is rest and then go and do your workout because you can't change the laws of nature. The body needs rest. You never work out a tired body. Mm. You never work out a fatigued body because that body's already under stress. Your blood pressure is going to be up. Inflammatory markers are going to be up. So that is a recipe for disaster. So, you know, I always tell people, you know, running marathons, you know, great, but then act like an athlete, train like an athlete, which is eat like them and also sleep like them. You can't run and say, I want to have my social life. That is one of the huge reasons that we have a lot of young people dying today of heart attacks because they don't understand the importance of sleep and recovery. A lot of them have minor blockages. They've not tested themselves. They've not screened themselves. Mm. What yeah. would you recommend to the CEO or uh, you know, the high level executive who doesn't get that much time away from his office but still wants to pursue his interest in running? You can still do it. Do it 30 minutes, do it 40 minutes, but you can't. If you want to be a, choose CEO or a sportsman. <laughs> That's what sportsmen do. They, they can't have everything. Mm. Look at them. I mean, certain truths have to be accepted. You can't be everything in life. A sportsman, I'm sure, would want to be so many things, but they need to focus on what their game is. A CEO needs to focus on that. They need to exercise. But be gentle with yourself or time management. Mm. We do some time management exercises with the billionaires of the world, and we still find that they have four to five hours extra in a day. Because when you budget time, you find out many things that we waste our time on. Mm. And then you realize, what's more important, this or your workout? my workout then let's move this over here and make some more time for your sleep so it's always possible how important is eating well and eating correctly uh, with sleep it's everything because and if, the yeah. timing as well yes because if i eat the wrong foods i can't sleep at night unfortunately one thing in india is people eat very late night meals mm -hmm. and that is also connected with type 2 diabetes pre-diabetes and sleep deprivation now picture this i eat a meal at 11 o'clock a heavy meal mm -hmm. let's say it's a biryani carb heavy meal okay and I go to sleep. I will fall asleep because I'm tired. Okay, as the carbs start to break down, what gets produced in the body? Energy. I'm not going to wake up, but I have a disruptive cycle. My pancreas have to produce insulin. So what I eat and when I eat, it's a beautiful question. The earlier I eat, the deeper my sleep's going to be. Even what I eat. Now, let's say I came home at 10 o'clock tonight and I want to sleep at 11 and I'm hungry. Mm. I will eat protein and I will eat fats, I will not eat carbohydrates because my body doesn't have a requirement for carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So I'll eat some veggies, I may, may eat a salad, whatever suits me, and some protein. So I can be flexible because lifestyle is such that today anything can change, mm -hmm. but I will adapt according to what I'm eating and I'll keep my heaviest meal, okay, for the earlier parts of the day. Mm -hmm. Okay, how important <clears throat> is sleep for children? Because, um, you know, there's a culture in India where fathers tend to come home late mm -hmm. from the office, Children tend to spend time with them at, in the later hours and they don't tend to sleep on what would be a regular time for a child. How important is sleep for children? I don't like to preach about this, so I'm going to talk about a little bit of science right now. Why do babies sleep so many hours? They sleep because there's growth happening in them. Until they're a complete young adult, all the growth happens while they sleep. Mm -hmm. Their liver, their kidney, their hormones, their gut everything and that's why they sleep naturally longer and as you see the infant growing up their sleep slowly starts coming down because they're growing up that is the importance of sleep and you are absolutely right today one of the biggest reasons in our country besides lifestyle and environment for juvenile diabetes pcos pcod is sleep deprivation you know medicine can't fix what sleep should do nor can food sleep has to fix what sleep does so I encourage parents out there, like, I understand you're coming home late, but let your child sleep. 
Maybe spend time with them in the morning or reorganize your weekend so that you can dedicate a weekend to them. I come home from late night flights as well, but my daughter will sleep on time because as much as I want to hold her and I, I want to give her a gifts and, you know, hug her, her sleep is way more important. So we can work around it when we think differently. But sleep is that foundation, not just for their health, but for their next day in school, their focus, their concentration. I can't tell you how many kids in our country and in Western cultures get put into the box of autism and ADHD. And while some are really genuine, a lot of them are sleep deprived children. And if they slept better, their milestones would be way, way better. So sleep is extremely important for children. Okay. What is your advice to people who are older and as they age, their sleep requirements and their sleep reduces? So what would you recommend to them? Follow that cycle. Wake up in five hours, go for a walk, meditate. Mm. But don't do things that are further reducing your hours. Mm. Like don't sleep late at night, don't get addicted to WhatsApp and Candy Crush and all of these things. That's eating into your actual sleep window because you have a small window. But yes, as we age, our sleep cycles will fall. And a lot of senior citizens today say, I want to take a sleeping pill because I want to sleep eight hours. But your body doesn't need eight hours. Mm. Let it be natural. As long as you're getting into bed at the right time, waking up before sunrise or with sunrise, you're absolutely perfect whether it was five or six hours of sleep. Well, we have a couple of queries which we got, um, so I'm going to you know, pose them to you. The first one is, the key question is, how much should one sleep and is it the same for all ages? It's not the same. Uh, for, for all ages, absolutely different. As we said, infants mm -hmm. could sleep 17 to 18. And as we come down for an, to an adult, anywhere, anywhere, and I, I even hate saying 7 to 8 because everyone's different. Now, picture of person A sleeping for six and a half hours, deep sleep, mm -hmm. deep sleep, wakes up, rested, ready to start the day. Someone sleeps for eight hours, but broken sleep, wakes up tired. Mm. It's not the quantity, it's the quality of sleep. So when we sleep deeper, our bodies are gonna finish its process faster and wake us up sometimes in six hours, sometimes in six and a half, sometimes in seven. So it is different and I encourage people to find out more or less what their average is. Like my average is between eight to eight and a half. Someone else is seven to seven and a half. And then try to fit yourself in that paradigm. How do you know your sleep is good for you? When you wake up in the morning, check in. Am I ready to start the day? Or do I need coffee to start my day? Or I'm like, I need more sleep. Mm. And then you say, oh, six hours isn't enough. Seven hours, or one day you wake up in seven and a half, and wow, I feel amazing. Start working towards seven, on, uh, seven and a half hours. Do you recommend wearing sleep trackers? Uh, I have a mixed notion on this. See, there are two kinds of people. Some people who love data, but they don't do anything with the data, mm. okay? They don't use the data. Some people, data stresses them out. Like I have so many calls from people, Luke, my device showed me I've not even slept last night. And my question is, how are you feeling? Oh, I feel great. <laughs> okay, what are you doing? I think it's a great benchmark, but I feel people using devices, we're losing our, our, our intuition. Mm. Every human being has intuition, when to stop eating, when to eat, when to sleep, when to wake up. I don't want gadgets taking away human intuition because then we're literally dependent on an AI or a gadget to tell us how to feel tomorrow. Mm. You know, so use it as a benchmark. Like I'll use a watch for 10,000 steps because I have a sitting job with patients. So I'd love to see the number and then try to make up those steps. I would say the stress of that gadget and your sleep is only giving you data. What, if you're using that data to improve your sleep, great, use the device. If it's stressing you out. Tips for good sleep. So number one, at least Monday to Friday, try to set your going to sleep time and your wake up time. Fix that, have that discipline. During your weekend, come home at 2, 3 in the morning, that's your chill out time, but then get back on track. So you're maintaining a circadian rhythm. Mm. As we maintain a rhythm, it starts to work for us automatically. Two, blue light before bedtime. At least an hour before bedtime. No gadgets. And if you have to, let's be practical. Sometimes I need to look at patients' reports right before I sleep. I will wear blue blockers mm. because blue blockers will cut out blue light that suppresses melatonin that allows me to sleep. Number three, 
try to make your room as dark as possible. In Mumbai, that may be really difficult, but simple. Use an eye mask or roll up a T-shirt and put it over your eyes. The more darkness you create, the deeper you sleep. The last 30 minutes before bed, that's your sacred time. Plan your day, write down everything for tomorrow. Try to bring down your thoughts. Do this beautiful breathing that's in our own yogic sciences and traditions. It's called left nostril breathing. Close your right nostril and take about 10 to 15 inhales and exhales through the left nostril. So do the sitting up and then lay down and sleep. Because if the mind is stressed out and there's chatter, there's no way you're going to get into deep sleep. So start calming down. The kind of series that you watch on TV, you know, you may think you're in control, but everything's going in your subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. So you may want to watch things that are more mellow. You may want to read a book, listen to music, pray, follow your spiritual path, but calm down. Move into the parasympathetic nervous system and you're going to sleep deeper. That's how it is. Okay, Luke, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining in on Thank the you, Medicine Aika. Box.